here we go. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here for Evidence of the Afterlife. I'm Dr. Lenore Matthew, and I have here with me my dear friend, my colleague. Jake, would you like to say hello? Hello, everyone. Jacob Cooper. Yeah, pleasure to meet you all. Beautiful. We are so excited. We are so excited for this event. We've been talking about this for a couple, a few months now that we've been planning it. And Jake and I connected through kind of two worlds that literally in quite, actually two worlds in many different ways, right? Um, the yes. two worlds that collided. One, we're both clinicians, we're both social workers. Um, so I'm a doctor of social work and my background is in research and evidence-based practice. And Jake is a licensed clinical social worker. And I'll let him talk about his work and his practice. But in addition to our social work and our mental health profession side, we both also have experience with the afterlife, personal experience. And so I am a evidential psychic medium and my mediumship opened up when my late husband crossed over a few years ago. And Jake is an NDE -er, or a near-death experiencer. So today we are going to talk about, we really just wanted to open up a conversation and demystify some of the experiences that we've had, some of the insights that we have, and really talk about how our experiences have changed our lives in challenging ways, but also for the better. What are some of the takeaways that we've learned? What are some of the evidence, both being very scientific people, what is some of the evidence that we've experienced? And also, how do we integrate these insights into our lives and our practice and our day-to-day -day being? Um, so it's really kind of taking down from a pedestal and normalizing and really demystifying experiences with the afterlife and saying they're very common. And also when we lean into them, they can be extremely transformational, especially when we share them amongst each other. So before I hand it over, I'll just quickly kind of share what we'll be talking about today or where we'll be going. So we have a few different topics that we'll cover for about until about the, the next hour or so. Um, so we'll be talking about our experiences, again, bringing forth evidence from our individual stories. And then we'll have a nice chunk of time, about a half an hour or so. And if we need more time, that's fine. We'll plan on going just about 90 minutes. Um, but again, we have some margin there. And that last chunk of a half an hour or so will be opening up to all of you. And so you can drop in the chat box any questions, any comments, any curiosities. If you want to send them privately to either Jacob or I, you're more than welcome to, if you don't feel comfortable sharing it with the group. And the idea here is just to have an open dialogue and really again, just answer any questions, curiosities that you might have. And we'll bring it together at the end and we'll ground and then we'll be on our way after this gathering. Okay, awesome. So I will pass it over to Jake if you wanna introduce yourself and kick us off and even diving into your story. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you, Dr. Lenore, uh, for organizing this event. And let's snap our fingers, or whatever we can do through Zoom, to really give her a big hand, you know, in orchestrating this. Um, you know, we wouldn't be here without your support and your coordination. Um, and also, thank you, you know, participants, for being here, taking your times out of your Monday and. You know, while people are tuning on to certain channels on the television, that's all well and good. You know, we're tuning into an afterlife frequency here today. We're tuning into a different channel. And as Dr. Lenore mentioned, um, you know, a little bit about myself. I'm also a clinical social worker or, I'm an, or an LCSW. I'm a near-death experiencer, which you'll we'll hear about soon. Um, and I'm, I'm an author of two different books with publishers called Life After Breath as well as the wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. And I do a lot of different uh, public presentations, you know, interviews, as well as my own podcast as well. So um, you've got a brain, you've got a body, I'm motivated to try to help you really from the ground up. And I think for us, this event made sense because uh, Dr. Lenore's background and my background are both, you know, with social work. And when people think of social work, they'll think of so many different things. They'll think of someone helping people financially or socially, or they'll think of someone, you know, seeing someone for therapy, you know, clinical practice. And that's reflective of the social work profession. There's so many different layers. And that's reflective of the many participants that I know I and Dr. Lenore have encountered in the sense that, 
people come from different cultures, different backgrounds, but everyone's looking for something that speaks to them. And we have people, you know, have Dr. Lenore and myself, we come from maybe different backgrounds, different experiences, but it's all different paths up to the mountain, you know, to hopefully remind you of the eternity of the soul. And, you know, Dr. Lenore, um, you know, faced, you know, the tragic, you know, crossing over, you know, of her spouse, and she faced physical death in front of her. And for myself, I'm a survivor of a near-death experience. And so for us, we're both two um, manifestations of the eternity of life right in front of you, as well as, you know, Dr. Lenore's, you know, incredible evidential mediumistic, you know, capabilities as well. So it's my hope that today, um, some of you may have a knowing, but some of you may have a, a curiosity to it, to an uncertainty, maybe a faith or a belief, but hopefully that will transform, you know, into a knowing. So my NDE, you know, for those who haven't read my books, who haven't heard about myself occurred at just the young age of three years old. It was September of 1993. And uh, to give, you know, my name away, I, I am of the Jewish faith and the Jewish tradition. I grew up, you know, in, a, in an Orthodox home. So it was right before the time of Yom Kippur, otherwise known as a day of atonement. It was a day, it's a day in the Jewish calendar, which many are familiar that the soul is ready, is getting itself ready to meet the creator and trying to, you know, rid all of its sins and write the near year off new. Um, little did I know I was about to meet the creator, but uh, it was in a literal sense, not through prayer or tradition or religion. It was, you know, literally, you know, meeting the creator. Um, I went to a playground with family friends of mine on that day in September of 1993. At the time I had pertussis, otherwise known as whooping cough. Um, and I didn't know this at the time. My parents did not know this, uh, but I decided to go to the playground. I climbed up to a ladder going onto a slide. And with each rung of the ladder, my breathing became more be belabored. And eventually I suffocated, which uh, was uh, the most tra traumatic event of my life. I don't want to sugarcoat that, but I do believe, and we'll get to this in a little bit, it's why I believe I'm able to have full recall of it due to the trauma. Uh, but you know, every part of my body was now just beginning to shut down as if you go into a basement and shut off one unit at a time. And I had no control over you know, you know what was happening to my physical body. And um, so I, I noticed that my body was really deprived of oxygen and there was no ability to breathe. And so rather than being in a car that isn't going to start, I decided to get out of my body and just pop the hood and just see what is going on. And so I was able to really have awareness at just the age of three years old of different parts of my body, but also I was able to feel and become aware of my brain. And in a couple moments later, I, I felt my brain just literally snap in half. And it was a large crack within my brain uh, that I felt. And, you know, there's a saying in the English language that says my brain cracked open and that's when God came in. And uh, I guess that's a euphemism, but this literally happened to me. My brain literally snapped in half due to the deprivation of oxygen. And that's when, you know, this afterlife awareness came full force at myself. Um, if you're familiar with maybe going to a roller coaster, um, if you go on the fastest possible ride on a roller coaster and you could feel yourself ascending to euphoria and just kind of letting go of any judgment or thought, you know, that's what I was feeling when I was crossing over to the other side. And I felt myself ascending to where there was no end in sight in the euphoria that I was feeling. And there was no end in sight with how high I was going, you know, and our bodies were used to being limited through our five senses. But when you leave the body, you're virtually unlimited if in the energy is euphoric love that you feel and it's familiar. Uh, but I felt myself becoming aware to the right side of my brain, uh, which represents our creativity, our, wins, our wisdom, you know, really the right side of our brain. But I saw to the right side of my brain, I, I saw a beautiful golden palace and I had to shield myself because this palace was so magnificent, but it was so beautiful and it was so powerful. But in looking at this palace, I knew that I was having a representation of the all that there ever is, ever was, and ever, ever will be, where all of life itself flows from it. And the best way that I could describe in our language is God, but that has a lot of religious connotations and words are limiting. 
but it's where all of life itself expresses and flows through itself. And through this awareness, I just became um, aware of this endless euphoric state that my spirit was in, where there was no end in sight, there was no time. Um, the best way I could describe it, um, that all was well, will be well, and is well on the other side. And in a lifetime, we sure are not used to that one where, you know, as Lao Tzu would say, we're oftentimes we brace for the future, which promotes anxiety. We hold on to the past, which promotes sadness. But this was an awareness that in the end, all is eternal love, all is unconditional, and all is euphoric love. Uh, moments later, I felt myself going down the slide into the right side and left side of myself. I felt my own spiritual guides or guardian angels, which before we come into this life, we're all assigned, you know, spiritual guides. And they're here, um, you know, as the closest connection to ourselves that we know. Um, the best analogy I could describe when I saw my guides was, um, was almost, I would say, disbelief that that these beautiful beings, you know, are so invested in me. It's as if you could imagine the most beautiful Hollywood celebrity crush that you have, that you feel is so out of your reach. But that Hollywood star on this pedestal feels the same exact way times 10 about you. And that's what I felt about my guides is that they were able to see the real me and the real you, which is an infinite divine spark and spiritual being. And they were incredibly beautiful. And I knew their names and it was a tremendous reunion. And moments later, my body was on the floor, lifeless um, and just flatlined and people around me at the playground that day were calling my name. And I felt myself to the side of my body and I felt the form and I wanted to just shake them that I was okay, that I was not my body, that none of us are really our body. We are just spiritual beings in this physical you know, uh, body. But um, I became aware more so of their thoughts and who they were. And I was able to see their auric fields around them. And you know, sometimes we think we really know someone, but we just know what we know. and. I was able to really see their core. Then moments later, I saw a beautiful, endless, uh, what I call sea of angels that was just floating right in front of me. And these angels were very youthful in their presentation versus the spirit guides were more, you know, uh, in their prime of their lives physically. But these angels that I saw, they were very, um, you know, childlike in their presentation. And when I saw the angels, I just almost had to pinch myself because they were literally right in front of me. You know, my form was to the side of my body and the angels are just a small filter above this reality. And they're just a, just a small switch of the dial above this reality. And they were just floating in this filter right in front of me. And when I saw the angels, I became aware that they were completely unconditional and their ability just to send love, to send healing, you know, to the whole planet and the situation itself. And I could hear their vibrational frequencies as well as their sounds. And it was incredibly, it was an incredible, beautiful symphony, you know, to see and to hear the angels. Um, then moments later, I just became aware of my soul family and which in our lives we incarnate with uh, different um, people, well, the same people in our soul family, we play different roles. And Shakespeare would say life is just, you know, it's like a theater, it's a stage, but we all have different roles, but we all reincarnate with, um, you know, different karmic responsibilities and duties and missions to balance out, you know, the, the play of life, so to speak. And moments later, you know, my guides and the angels and my loved ones, you know, asked me, what would I do? Would I, you know, stay and continue on the other side or would I continue, you know, living out my, my life as Jacob? And, you know, I, I just had curiosity. What would I look like? What would my life be like? You know, what would I physically turn into? What, what, why am I here? And just with an intentional question, I asked, well, if I do stay, what's going to happen? Uh, moments later, I was just, I had what's called life review, which for those of you familiar with, is a panoramic view of the life, but also your awareness through what others see. Now, you may say you were three years old. What the hell could you see? Well, I, I could say it's not a matter of the years of your life, but rather the life within the years. And there's people who could live 100 years and it could feel like a second, or those 100 years could have the impact of eternity or, or 10 years, 20 years, a minute. You know, there is 
you know, time is not what we think it is on the other side. It's much, uh, on this side, it's much different over there. Um, but then I was able to become aware of past lives and different lifetimes that I lived. And I was aware of, um, you know, a little bit, I'll discuss the connection of why I think I had a near-death experience and how that related to a past life. But I saw, you know, later in myself speaking in front of a lot of people. And it's not like I was some uh, pompous guru who was above people talking and, you know, just whatever. It was that I was one with the message. I was just the instrument through this message. And I looked at the eyes of the people that I would, you know, connect to. And I said, you know, I just thought to myself that the other side will always be there, but this unique window to bring this to other people is something that I, you know, couldn't pass up. And with that decision, you know, everything dissipated from my immediate awareness, although it never will leave any of us. We're always surrounded by this love and this awareness. And I was slowly just felt with doubt where I was just asking, how could this happen? How do I know that this is factually true, that I will be able to help people and this life will actually have meaning? I mean, I'm just turning down heaven to come back to here. How will I know that this will be worthwhile? And the guides told me that, you know, basically we all have a blueprint. We all have, you know, a life plan. But the important thing is really to trust in that plan over our own doubts over our own fears and to trust in the divine intelligence that created us over our own limitations or judgments of that and to be able to surrender uh, to that force. And so I woke up at a hospital bed. My mother was around me and had the last, rest of my life to live uh, after that experience in terms of uh, making sense of it. And so uh, within the next segment, I know Dr. Lenore will get into her story, but we'll get into you know, I know a lot of people I'm sure have questions, but we'll also discuss the meaning, uh, the messages and uh, something that hopefully each and every one of you uh, could take with you after this uh, dialogue. So yes, Dr. Lenore, uh, I would like, I would love to hear your transformational story and understanding your why and how I know that determined your how and your what in terms of the work that you are doing. So uh, I'll give you the, I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much and i'm over here writing notes and just to hear your presence i know that we know each other quite well but to hear your story in this setting it's just it's so powerful so thank you so much and it's so validating as well because we are on these kind of two sides of life after life really it's life after life and to hear some of the things that you've experienced that my husband showed me from the other side it's just the corroboration is it it just it really means the world. Mm. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes. So my story began, well, it probably began many, many lifetimes ago, but the story of the context of today, um, my interaction with an understanding of the afterlife began March 5th, 2020. It started out as a very normal day. Um, I was living abroad with my husband. We had been together and we were partners um we were a couple for 13 years we were the best of friends we did everything together we were attached in many many ways I mean he's just he was we were each other's world I was at a co-working cafe on my laptop I had recently returned with my husband back from a three-month sabbatical we had gone to South Asia for a few months of yoga and meditation I had resigned from my job. I used to work at the United Nations. So I was a policy and research analyst at the UN headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. So we were living abroad. My husband was from a third country, he's Argentinian and from the States. And we lived in Europe for many years for our careers. My entire career, my doctorate, my research, my job was based on evidence. I was an evidence-based practice specialist and an evaluation officer. So my entire being, at least in a professional sense, was based around show me the evidence so that I believe that something is true. Otherwise, I'm skeptical. I resigned from my position knowing that there was something else, and I had no idea what it was, but I just felt in my gut something was coming. And I also felt that I would be starting my own practice, and I had no idea what it would be about, but I knew it would be helping people. We left on the sabbatical, we were under work stress and we just were together enjoying being with one another. And then we went back to Europe. 
on March 5th in my co-working cafe, working on a program that I had no idea where it was going. I had no idea why I was in this position. And my husband's best friend walked in with his partner into the cafe. And he said, sorry, it's been three and a half years and it still um, is a bit raw. And he said, um, Len, something terrible happened. And I, my entire body froze and I said, what? And he said, Bruno, who's my husband, he said, Bruno fell. And I said, what do you mean he fell? And he said, he fell Len, he's not here anymore. From there, it's a blur. There are things that I remember, things that I don't. Within a few hours, we were in the police station of the city we were living in. We were living just outside of Barcelona. And the main detective said, I'm sorry, he didn't fall. He ended his life. He chose to fall. He chose to take his life by the way that he did. I was just overcome with my screen to the detective. I jumped across the desk and I said, this is impossible, the detective's desk. And he had a piece of paper with him. And he said, Bruno left this letter. It was in his pocket when he took his life. So I jumped across the desk to grab the letter. I didn't believe it. I said, someone else wrote this, someone else did this. And he said, no, and he showed it to me. And it was my husband's handwriting. I knew his handwriting. My husband showed no signs at all that he was suffering. He had shown no signs at all that he was in pain, that definitely none, that he, or no signs that he was suicidal. After I read the letter, I understood that it absolutely was him taking his life, but I didn't understand. I didn't understand. It came out of nowhere. He was the happiest, most loving, empathetic, joyful person. Everybody loved to be around him. Everybody loved to be around Bruno. I was with our best friends. Um, his childhood friend was the one who told me he was living in the same city. And we went back to a hotel that was around the corner from the police station. Obviously, no one wanted to be alone. They specifically said, don't let her be alone, meaning me. And we're all crammed into a hotel room in the middle of the night, it's pitch black. And all of a sudden, the window slams open in the hotel room. I sit up. There are dogs barking in the street below. There's no reason for dogs to be in the middle of the street in the middle of downtown Barcelona, but there were. I sit up and I feel my husband all around me, in me, through me. It's him, it's him. Again, we've been together for a third of our lives. Like I know his energy more intimately than anyone, sometimes even better than my own. And it was him. And I just said into the darkness that I know it's you, I know it's you, I know it's you, but I don't understand please tell me, please help me, please help me understand. As I said, we had been on a sabbatical for a few months. And for the first time, really in my life, we had started to settle down in terms of being in the body. So I learned meditation, I learned yoga quite intimately. And I think that that helped kind of have a platform in my body for me to be able to move into a place where I could feel and be sensitive to energy. So in that moment, when I told Bruno, show me what to do, I fell very quickly into a meditative state. My eyes were closed, but the most vivid vision I've ever had, still to this day, one of the most vivid visions that I've ever had mediumistically came through. I was on, he showed me a few different images before, and then it cut to, I'm on a bank at a river. Again, this is behind closed eyes in a hotel room. I'm sitting up, but it looks so clear. It's like a movie behind my eyes. We're on the bank of a river. There's purplish brown water. I know exactly what the water is. It's his hometown, a river in his hometown, a place that he loved very much. And I asked him, I said, okay, I know where we are. Keep showing me, keep showing me. And as I do, I feel my body relax and I look around and I see all of our close friends in this vision. Everyone is dressed down, wearing like sandals and shorts and soccer jerseys, they're Argentinian. So everyone is wearing a soccer jersey. Of course, soccer is like their religion. <laughs> I can smell barbecue in the air. I can hear music thumping. I can feel the energy of everyone around me. There's immense love, immense remorse. I can feel Bruno around me, but I know he's not there. And I just know with all of my being that he's telling me he wants this as a celebration of his life. He wants to be known and remembered in this way. And he's telling me that he wants to be cremated and offered to his river. We'd never talked about passing before. We were in our mid-30s mid when, he, when he crossed over. 
I thought that we had five decades plus before we even needed to consider this. Also in my family, we bury, we don't cremate. So that never would have come into my conscious mind, but I just knew that's what he was saying. I came out of the vision. I felt his energy almost like reverse and move out. I knew that he would come back, or at least I was desperate to hope that he did. And I said, please keep guiding me. Please keep guiding me. Experiences like this happened multiple times a day for weeks. And I realized the next morning after I recognized what happened and I realized what happened, I realized that my experiences had actually started three months before my husband crossed over. I just didn't know it at the time. I didn't recognize it. And I was so scared of them, really. I blocked them out. And so before he had passed, I started having visions of his funeral. I started having visions of someone's life ending. I started having visions of um, the reason why I would find out later why he took his life. And they, they scared me quite frankly, so I blocked them out. I would later realize from his letters that the week that I began having my visions three months before was actually the week that he began writing the documents and letters that he would leave, but I wouldn't find this out for a few weeks. So his visions and visits continued and eventually they started to piece together evidential and objective information that led me to uncovering what contributed to him ending his life. Objective information that I could validate and inevitably act on but I uncovered, and I never knew this in the physical, but I uncovered that my husband was horrifically abused as a child and he never sought help for it. He never told me. Through his visitations to me from the other side, he actually gave me the information that I needed to piece this together. Within a month of him passing, other spirits began coming to me from the other side. I didn't know any of them in the physical world, but I knew their loved ones. Being the researcher that I am, again, my career is in data. My career is in evidence. I was, I'm trained at doctoral level in how to evaluate evidence. I documented everything. So I kept matrices of what happened, who came to me, daytime, if any other people were with me, because oftentimes other humans were with me, uh, what the message was. If something could be voice recorded, I would voice record me having conversations with the person in spirit. Sometimes physical things would happen. I would video record them. I would take pictures and I would document folders of these things. Within a couple of weeks, and then I'll wrap this up and turn it back to, to Jacob. But within a couple of weeks of these things happening, it was actually about six weeks, I was talking to a good friend of mine. I was very vocal about my experiences. Something said that I had to be very vocal and something told me I had to document this all. But I was talking to a good friend who's in the corporate business world, very left brain like me, but also very intuitive. And she said, have you ever thought about talking to a medium? I was like, I don't know what a medium is. What is a medium? <laughs> is it a psychic? I would find out that a psychic and medium are different things. But at the time, I didn't know. Psychics connect human to human. Mediums connect um, a human being up to the spirit world. But I said, why not? You know, something in me said to do it. And I knew that I needed some sort of information that I wasn't getting in any other place. So I asked Bruno, meanwhile, I'm very skeptical of all of this and I don't believe it, but yet I'm asking my husband on the other side for insight. So I'm talking to someone who's not even physically here, but I'm skeptical of the spirit world. It was just a whole mind, mis you know, like tornado really is what it felt like. But I asked Bruno to lead me to my first medium an incredible medium. And within moments of meeting me, he pulled through, he knew nothing about me. I wasn't on social media, nothing at the time. And he pulled through Bruno and without knowing anything about me, he also tapped into that experience at the river. And he asked me, would you understand what Bruno is showing me? And I said, yes. So fast forward, I began uh, developing as a medium, and I eventually, I'll get into this later, but I eventually moved into working as a medium, and it's led me to my path now, which is about education around mediumship, research around mediumship, um, and also working with other people who are developing mediums. That was a bit long-winded. Thank you for hanging in for that. <laughs> it was profound on many levels, you know, mm -hmm. and I, like you said, I have heard you talk, but every time that you hear someone talk, you hear something different. And, yeah. you know, this seems like a phenomenon that, you know, we know as a shared death experience where, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, when someone crosses, whether that be a pet or a loved one, oftentimes we 
could join that person on the other side and experience a part of where they are. And that gives, you know, hopefully for, for us, so those witnessing it, the understanding that we certainly go on. Um, you know, in, in terms of piecing some lessons together, you know, I think when people experience a trauma, near-death experience, a shared death experience, there's, I'm sure, a great deal of research that will, um, you know, move to the notion that it does take time to make sense of your experience, to process it. You know, for myself as a near-death experiencer, they, they will say for kids or infants, they'll say it takes around two to three decades to really make sense of it all. And um, that's about true. Um, you know, after I had my NDE, I knew I was much different. And, you know, one thing I really learned is uh, the brain is so pivotal within our lives. You know, sometimes, um, you know, from what I learned in my near-death experience, the brain is just a filter of of life. And in our society, we, we look at the brain is the producer of life many times, and that's called material reductionalism, meaning you take yourself and reduce it. There's nothing you, of you left if we all are is a body or a brain. Uh, but I learned in my NDE that there's a separate higher mind and there's a brain. So the higher mind works itself through the brain. And once your brain goes, you know, you could have continual awareness. And people who, for instance, have... Um, you know, let's say like lucid visions or they're, you know, let's say an Alzheimer's and they're about to, you know, go, they'll often have these experiences of crossing over to the other side. And many times the loved ones will get very excited, but their brainwave activity is actually a lot lower while their consciousness, while their awareness is, is higher. You know, so to this day, um, you know, a lot of the medical community and scientific community can't um, explain why that phenomenon occurs when brainwave activity brainwave activity is very low, why your awareness and high is very high. And so, you know, that's one lesson that I learned is that the brain is so pivotal in our life. And it's really forged me on a path to understand the brain, not only for myself, but for my clients and, you know, understanding healthy brain activities, you know, so for instance, I'll give you an example, the front part of the brain, it's, you know, it's, it's related to what's called the prefrontal cortex, which is all about self-awareness. And people who practice meditation or go to psychotherapy, see someone like myself, they have a lot more developed prefrontal cortexes or the awareness of the self than those that don't. And there's a lot of different exercises that people could do from meditation, you know, through walking and eating right that could help us enhance our brains to be a clear filter between the two worlds. And so that our life isn't produced by our brains, but rather we could be a conduit between the two worlds. Uh, the second is, is that um, we are eternal beings. Uh, many times we'll we'll hear that notion and then we'll just forget about it or just, you know, limit ourselves. And so, you know, I'll give an example. Um, the relationship with how we see ourselves is so pivotal within our life. Um, you know, there was a time when people would walk around seeing the world as just flat, and that was their worldview. That was their belief. And that's all that they saw. But through stretching that box, through venturing out into different worlds, you know, people found, you know, outside of the flat earthers that that's not the case, that the world is round and uh, this world is a beautiful big place. And so, you know, many times it's not always the case, but, you know, many times through grief or near death experiences, shared death experiences, or just different transformative experiences, um, we certainly would rather have it the other way, but it's what I call shake up periods of the soul, where sometimes we get uh, complacent within this life. You don't even think about you know, our own, the own finite reality of our bodies. And seeing the passing of a loved one could force many to reevaluate, what is this all about? You know, Who am I? Why am I here? And the rug and the foundation that we were standing on can no longer be stood on. There's a different foundation that happens through shakeup periods. And so I think what's important is to constantly be curious and to constantly reevaluate what we're seeing and to keep ourselves open. Uh, and that separates itself from someone who may be cynic, which is maybe closed off to healthy skepticism, uh, which is a good place to be in, which is you're open to it, but you need evidence and data. Um, because, you know, Dr. Lenore could certainly test to it when someone does lose a loved one, they 
are often prey to manipulation or people taking advantage of their own grief. Um, and I would say probably around 85 to 90 percent of people out there are not evidential, meaning they're not scientifically tested. They are not able to give evidence of proof. They could give very generic information and they will placate off stuff and they'll do code readings. And it's, you know, it's kind of wishful thinking it takes advantage of a desperate situation. So, um, you know, it's important to be kind of like a lawyer in a courtroom where you're trying to build a case of eternity. And for each person, you're able to find different cases of evidence, you know, of things that, you know, do speak to evidence and your connections that, you know, the laws of probability can never create, even if you tried. And those are called synchronicities and signs, which we'll get into in a little bit. The third lesson is we are so much more than what we think we are. We walk around, like we said, with our personalities, our egos, and our genders, our cultures, and all these things are part of us, the human side, but these are experiences of the soul. Uh, many people come up to me and they said, wow, you were only three years old. You know, How is it possible that you had this awareness? How is it possible for you to remember? Uh, what I say to them is, hey, how could I ever forget You know, something so profound? But also is that we are not our chronological ages. Uh, we may attach ourselves with us at, in our 40s or 50s or 30s. These are all things that we experience, but we are infinite eternal beings temporarily having these human experiences. So the next time you look at a kid or you know someone, you just have to find that divine spark and understand that there's an infinite aware spiritual soul going on. And just because it's not expressed you know, through the body, through the instrument, does not mean that under the surface there's a whole underlying layer of awareness, you know, that doesn't express itself. Um, so I hope some of that makes sense. And also, we have many different, you know, lives before we get here. This is not our first journey. You know, just imagine, um, you know, a body of water in an ocean. And I live on the water. I just moved by here, but I'll give an example. You know, we kind of come from this ocean. We go onto the shoreline and experience life, you know, on this earth, and then we come back to the shore. And this is an infinite cycle of, of journeying. Uh, at a certain point, you know, we evolve, we may go on to different dimensions or different roles on the other side, uh, but we are eternal. And <clears throat> from completion, we always begin. And when people think of eternity, they'll just think of the concept, but just think of eternity, that there's no beginning, there's no middle, there's no end. And that's not something that our left brains could understand. And our left brains in its nature is very um, linear. And so I think what's important is when you listen to this talk is really to find a different part of your awareness to understand it. Because our baseline awareness, it's important to, yes, have the left brain stuff, but part of our baseline awareness has to come uh, from a certain level to understand the subject matters you know, not just from an intellectual understanding, but also an experiential reality. Um, the third is we all have, one of the other lessons is we all have an infinite array of angels, spirit guides, and loved ones all around us. Um, you know, many times people fall in love with Marvel characters and some of my clients, you know, who are kids or adolescents love Spider-Man, but you just have to ask yourself, why do people fall in love with these superheroes or celebrities? And I think it speaks to a reflection that people see themselves in another person, that we all are superhuman beings. We all are infinite spiritual beings. We all have powers within us, spiritual powers, but we all have an infinite array of an army around us. And so on a human level, we could really feel alone or, or feel isolated or feel lonely, but that does not um, take away from the fact that we are never alone on this path. We always have you know, so much around us, and they are just um, a thought away, but they are able, they really have a transparent understanding of who we are at a deeper level, and they do something that's called understanding, um, and our lifetime, we're used to people judging us, or people looking down on us, uh, but the other side, they literally take themselves and look up at you, and not down at you, and they are able to see uh, the core you, um, and we'll get into some of the other lessons, but I think it's important, you know, to also um, overcome the culture of myth. You know, there's this could be a whole segment in itself, but there's so many different myths within our culture that we inherit that add to this box of reality. You know, the first myth is um, we have to 
uh, do something great in order to be something great. And, you know, at least in the Western world where I live, you grow up, you get a good grade, all of a sudden your value of self increases. You get a bad grade in school, you feel like a failure. And there's there's no, there's a, it makes sense why so many have uh, an unstable sense of identity. You know, that constantly, in other words, the way that the world sees them influences their soul, their mind, instead of this beautiful eternal being, right, being and not doing influences the world they live in. And so uh, the significance of re-remembering ourselves past, you know, the human identity and the human programming is very important. In other words, in order to really find yourself, you have to be willing to lose a part of what you're holding on to. So those are some, you know, bits and pieces that I've gathered and they're you know, uh, further incorporated in both of my books. Uh, but I hope some of this made sense. And I know Dr. Lenora sure has a great deal of, of wealth of information and lessons um, from her experience. And, you know, I love the quote that uh, God made us because God loves stories. And I think we really have to understand, you know, our experiences, our stories, but, you know, it's important uh, for us to, to define our stories and not for the stories to define us. And at times we could vacillate between the two. Uh, but I think in life, what we walked into is not our fault, but we walk, what we walk out of that, you know, has some free will to it and has some uh, flexibility. And so I know Dr. Lenore certainly walked into a tremendous traumatic event, totally out of our hands, but what she walked out of was an incredibly transformative being that was always deep there inside of her that was just unlocked. Uh, so yeah, anything that you have to share, I am all yours myself too. Thank you for that. I think I want to take a step back and speak to, oh, first of all, yes. And it's again, it's so interesting with our different perspectives. And it's like, they're almost like two sides of this pole of, it's not a pole. It's almost like a spectrum of possibilities, perhaps, or maybe it's like beyond dimensions. Who knows? I'm sure it is quite literally. But the space of stepping into or letting myself to surrender into whatever would come out of this I mean, it was something that was so out of my control and many days still is. When Bruno died, and this was the case up until not too far in the past, like a couple months, I mean, there were moments, of course there were, when I did not want to be here. And I haven't met one widower, widower, or survivor of suicide loss, or survivor of sudden traumatic loss, who hasn't said, I don't want to be here. And we have to normalize that because, and not necessarily that, but normalize the depth of the pain that goes along with opening up, whatever opening up may be, opening up to our, our grief, to trauma, to spirituality, to finding a different way forward, to surrendering to whatever it is that we're surrendering to. I wish that it had been a smooth ride, but it was so far from that. And it was almost like I was so broken and my life was so obliterated and my reality was so obliterated, not only my human life and that I'd lost my husband, my best friend, my house. I also lost like two of my passports. I lost the country that we were living in. I couldn't, I didn't have rights to live there anymore. So I was only there by marriage and I lost access to my bank account because I was there by being his wife. So I went from being this incredibly independent, very strong person to yes, that's still my essence, but I was like barely breathing. And I made a deal with myself. I told myself, I literally, and if the, as we know, the five stages of grief has, it, that needs to be retired like decades ago. But there was a place where I was bargaining with myself. And I said, if I can make it every day to the point where I can at least get out of bed, I don't even need to brush my teeth. I don't even need to take a shower today. If I can step my feet on the floor, then I know that I'm doing a really good job. And it was that just breath. But I would tell myself, and I still tell myself this breath by breath, not even day by day, breath by breath. Inhale once more. You can do this. You can inhale. Please do this. Do this. Inhale, Lenore. And it was that, like just very small, barely measurable steps that allowed myself to break and rebuild and break and rebuild. And it's just, it's a process. The coming into the place where I can say that life is very different now and it's 
joyful and I'm a happy person. And I always have been a relatively happy person. And I refound myself in that. It really was by allowing myself to surrender to something that I never would have even comprehended before Bruno passed and allowing ourselves to be, you know, look like I don't know, maybe somebody looks at us like we're weak or we're broken, whatever the label is, it doesn't matter to let ourselves live our authentic experience and let it hurt and let ourselves be there without judgment. If I didn't feel, let myself feel all of the pain and the anger I felt, and I mean, just a, a myriad of emotions that I'd never experienced before, that would never have allowed me to break to the point where I was like, okay, I'm ready to take steps towards something else. And again, it's not like it's a linear process. It's like this back and forth and opening up spiritually brings up things. It was like grief was the opener. And then there were all these things that would come out, like things like I realized how the extent to which I denied myself and my intuition for my entire life, the ways in which I was living my life for other people, not myself. I mean, just all of these ways that we break open through trauma, whether it's traumatic loss of someone or of someone or or another traumatic experience. The thing that kept me going, two things kept me going. One was that intuitive knowing that this had to be for something. And it was linked in many ways to the intuitive knowing like why I needed to document everything, why I needed to be vocal about my experience. I just, I knew in my gut, even though I had no idea where it was going, I knew in my gut that I had to lean into this experience, especially of the afterlife, even though it was totally counter to what my analytical brain was telling me. I had to do this and I knew that it was to set a space for other people to know that this is a reality partly to know that our loved ones are with us, partly to know that we can have these intuitive abilities, even if we never had them before. Um, And then I had to lean into this because it's like, I had no other choice. I had no other choice. Bypassing it wasn't a possibility for me. I didn't, that just felt so inauthentic in my body. And so I really learned to tune into what my body was telling me. The other thing that really kept me going was what Bruno would tell me about the other side. And I believed it, even the more subjective things than I still do, one, because it made tremendous sense. And two, because of the things that he would tell me, the objective information, like he would say, go to my computer, find this hidden file. I didn't even know you could hide files on a computer. And I would do what he told me to do. And I would find exactly what he said I would find. And it would give me more information about his passing. That's how I found some of the documents that he left. And so that more objective information to me only validated the more subjective things he would tell me. And one thing that he told me that I just kept holding close, and this was was really those moments, and there were a few of them, where I would find myself on the bathroom floor or my bedroom floor, just, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this. I would remember what Bruno said, and he said, it doesn't matter if it's on this side or the other one. We have to face our pain. We cannot avoid it. Ending your life does not start to slate over. It does not give you a pass go, collect $200. He had to, and what you said about the life review, he told me this before I ever read this or heard about this from mediums. He showed me this as well. And as soon as he got to the other side, I know there was tremendous like holding of him. I know that he was in a safe space, but he had to address the pain and his past that contributed to him ending his life. And he's shown me through meditations the way in which he's experienced my life and other loved ones in our lives, perspective of his passing. So for example, in one meditation, and I love how spirit does this, they give, or at least they do to me, because I know that I'm ever skeptical, even though I'm a practicing medium now. But in one meditation, Bruno came to me, and this was not long ago, maybe a year ago. And I was meditating, and that's the main way that I communicate with him although he just pops in as well sometimes, but in meditation, we meet and he brought me to our wedding and we're at the altar, but he's having me in like stand in his body. And I've had several meditations where he puts me in his body. He's allowed me to be in his body. So I actually feel what it was like to have hidden depression, for example. I don't know personally what that feels like, but he allowed me to feel that in his body. But in this meditation, he put me in his body. So I'm actually looking at myself at the altar of our wedding and he looks at my dad and in this meditation. So I'm looking at my dad through Bruno's body and he shows me that he's crying and he shows me how much remorse and sadness he had towards my dad. My dad and I are very close towards my dad at the wedding because he knew that he was 
not fully being forthcoming with me about his mental health, about our relationship. I feel that Bruno was suicidal for a very long time. He just hid it for years. I think he was suicidal even before I met him. And he let me feel what he would feel towards my dad, which helped me understand because many times when Bruno would come through to other mediums since he crossed, he would always bring up to those other mediums, please tell your dad, so my father, please tell him Bruno's sorry. And he's working on that relationship. And so he helped me understand like the complexity of it between that relationship. And of course, my dad, he's so kind and empathetic and he understands. And now he talks to Bruno and my dad is, I mean, he's like, he would not think that mediumship is a real thing until this opened up for me. And now he's a total believer because he's actually seen some of these things happen and I've even done readings for him. But what Bruno showed me, and I believe this, is that he had to, and we all have to address our pain. And so I would go back to that in the moments where I was like, I can't do this. And it, to me, it would feel like I was, I'm very sentient in my mediumship. And now I'm aware that I'm a very sentient person overall, which means my emotions are so big, they burst out of my body, like it's huge. And I would go back to that teaching from Bruno. And I would say, if I feel, if I can't continue on, I'm just going to have to face this on the other side. And then what Bruno also told me as like a point B to his point A was not only do we have to face our pain, be it here or over there, but it's actually better if we face it on this side in the human physical world, because it's on this side that we have resources like ample physical resources to impact and change our trajectory, our way of being, our actions, our behaviors, our frameworks, the way that we understand and believe ourselves and what happened to us. And more than that is on this side, that we have ample energy to make a huge impact, waves of impact on our environments and the people around us. Bruno was doing that from the other side, living through me. I now do a lot of advocacy work with other male survivors. I speak very openly. A film is being made about our experience, a short film, and it's being it's based off of an article that I wrote. So I do a lot of advocacy articles. I do a lot of talking about child abuse and, and male survivors of childhood sexual abuse, which was my husband's experience. So in that way, he's living on through me. And even so, if I were to go to the other side, like I can't even imagine the mountains I would have to move to try to have that same impact. And I, I don't even know if it would be possible. Could it be possible? I don't think so. I mean, I surrendered my life pretty much to Bruno to build this connection. And now part of my life path is trying to convince people through evidence that it's real. It's like, oh man, you really signed me up for a big one, okay. But I accept it and I love it and it's what I'm here for. But I know, I know, I know that I physically have to be here in order to do that work. And I think as we surrender into what the spirit world, what our own souls may tell us, it's yes, we're not alone, absolutely. But it's in those moments where we feel nothing but alone. And that's what it would feel to me. I would feel like I was in a black hole. I would go back to, I can't feel it right now, but I know that it's bigger than me in this moment. I know it's bigger than this black hole. I've just got to hang on until it shifts. And then what would let it shift would be working with mediums, working with my spirituality, working with my counselor. I, mean, I very much believe in both clinical mental health and spiritual health. And I will say one last thing before I turn it back over. I have, so part of the work that I'm doing now, I'm working with a very close colleague. Um, her name's Kate Stakeholm. I just, I think the world of her, she's a medium as well as a licensed clinical social worker. And we work very closely together, both in mental health and in mediumship. We do readings together. We've done events together. Um, and I have found in my experience as a sitter, both as a medium and in training and developing in mediumship. So I did within eight months after Bruno passed, I began formally developing as a medium. So I studied with incredible, very well-known international mediums. And I found particularly in the seat of someone receiving mediumship readings, Yes, absolutely. We need to have someone who's evidentially based. I'm trained in evidential mediumship, which means we get physical, we, we, well, if anyone here doesn't know what evidential mediumship is, is, we set the intention to get as much objective information to be certain that it's the person that we're speaking with. But even more than that, or at least on the same, I'll say not even more, I'll say on the same playing field, it, it's so imperative that the mediums we're working with, the healers, the mental health practitioners that we're working with are grief-informed and trauma-informed. And I've had experiences with 
some incredible mediums who are certified and just and really well known. And the experience was very painful because it was not grief and trauma informed. And so I think it's, we're moving into a place and it's, it's not a fault of anyone. And, and I understand this being a medium and a social worker. Sometimes you kind of almost become anesthetized to the extent to which this can hurt someone or the experience can be hurting uh, in, of someone in it. But I think it's really important. And I do feel that we're shifting this way. We're hearing things like trauma-informed mediumship. We're definitely hearing trauma-informed social work, grief-informed social work. And that's so imperative. So it's like we're moving. It's no one's fault. That they're absolutely not pointing fingers, not at all. It's more opening up a dialogue of where are we going in terms of the support and bringing together the mental health and spiritual communities. And I think the way that they cross over is at the end of the day, those of us who are in these helping fields want to help. We, were, we came back. We were born in this body to help. And now it's kind of like digging in into the beautiful ways that we all contribute to this help and doing so by drawing on the strengths of the clinical world, of the trauma-informed world, of the grief-informed world, and of people who are going through these lived experiences to hear from them. And that's really what my research now is focused on, is hearing from people who have gone through these experiences, losing a loved one, working with someone mediumistically. What worked for you? What do you want to see in your practice? What was most effective? What are the best practices? So the, I'll just say quickly, the research that I do now as part of my practice is I work with people to evaluate how impactful mediumship is on their healing, be it from the loss of a loved one or something else traumatic that happened. Then I also look at uh, people who've awakened to their mediumship abilities and how is it impacting their trauma healing. And overwhelmingly across the board in all of the research that I'm doing, I find that it's just this like shedding of the ego, this real authenticity, falling into opening up to a genuine dialogue, discussion, openness about the pain, and then an openness to there's something bigger and beyond that. I have to say as well in my the space that I'm in, only when I do mediumship readings, there's this glass that like clicks for some reason. I've, there's no reason why it happens and it's been clicking the whole time we're speaking. So I just had to throw that out too. <laughs> Ways that they come into our physical space. <laughs> another, another piece of evidence, you know, working itself. Um, you know, I think the, obviously the different paths that the mountain that we took to their um, understanding of eternity were different. But the parallels within ourselves and so many transformative uh, teachers and healers uh, are the same in a sense that we have a painful experience that may arise or may not. And, you know, that experience literally took, you know, physically my breath away, your breath away too, even metaphorically and physically. Um, in the Jewish tradition, you know, where I come from, the word for spirit um, is translated as ruach, which means the wind of God. Or the breath of God. And so when you have experiences that take away your own breath, um, it's, it's significant to be able to surrender to what's going on to the pain, but also for it to be a doorway of remembering who we are, where we come from, what we're infinitely connected to, the infinite breath that connects us, that we're able to have us transcend you know, anything that may come our way. Um, I know a lot of our work, Dr. Lenore and I, is uh, grief-oriented. You know, we work with a lot of people in our own ways and also professionally with grief, um, as well as working with pain, you know, in dealing with mental health. Um, I think one of the barriers that I face, you know, personally and professionally, is the uh, current trajectory of our society, which offers a lot of access to mental health and grief awareness, uh, but is also very focused on bypassing um, and trendiness and wanting the next the next thing and um, the difficulty to sit with what is and what is currently going on you know I'll, and so Dr. Lenore hit on a point that the value of pain is that in a way it could be a doorway to transformation and purpose but to not bypass it you know if you look at a hurricane on the outside of a hurricane it's mayhem it's it's wild it's craziness but you know, the inside of the hurricane is the eye and the calm within the storm, you know, and plenty of people who transform are able to tap into this inner calm, this inner awareness, you know, when mayhem comes their ways. And I think, you know, it's important to understand our natural progressions and reactions, but to know that, you know, everything 
passes, including us, but the one thing that is left is our experiences and our eternity. And so to embrace pain in a way, which is something that we're not taught, we're taught to run away from it. You know, for instance, when a herd of buffalo senses dangers, they don't run away from it, they run towards it. And I think that's important is to really embrace what is and not try to bypass it because it's like you work now or pain now or just grows and becomes more later. So that's why the mental health component is so significant because I think a lot of people within you know, our work are very maybe spiritually inclined, but you know, they will often have judgment towards mental health or uh, they won't be able to validate it as something authentic or something real. Uh, so the spiritual awareness is one component of ourselves, but we also have the human part and you know, the mental health side. And I think when all of our bells and whistles are working and all of our parts of us and needs are being met, you know, we could really have transformation uh, within our lives. And so from, you know, a grief perspective, um, you know, a tip that I've, I've learned is, is yes, to surrender to it. You know, obviously, um, Dr. Kuba Ross's work is, you know, at, at a time is very innovative, but now, you know, it comes with, you know, degree of criticism, uh, but I think there's value in it in a sense that um, people forget that there are common stages, but those stages, you know, may switch. You may not have the first initial, you know, stage. You may have stage five or stage three, and people go through um, a lot of that. But, you know, the hope is through loss is that people could find meaning. Um, I know we're talking a lot about the afterlife, um, but I think a lot of it is being, you know, we're talking a lot about life after death, but I think the significant is for each of one, every one of us with loss is to find life after their death. And that's the challenging piece is that we know that they may be okay, but for us to find life is hard. And some days it may feel like there's absolutely no life and that's what is. And other days we may find more awareness. And so I think it's significant, like Dr. Lenore was saying, is to you know, take one step at a time. That step may be backward, that step may be forward, but either way, we are present wherever we are by not wanting to be a certain place. In our society, we always want, we always are taught to be something else other than what we are. And that's very programmed. And we always just want to be something else. It's a rather insidious thing to want something that we don't have rather than to embrace and accept with what we do have and where we are. And so that's a lot of mindfulness 101 is, you know, being present in the present. And I think sometimes when pain comes to us, we, you know, have the human reaction where this happened to us, the me, and that's true on one way. But from the spiritual perspective, which is able to transform the me, the spiritual perspective transforms the me into the we, that this thing that we experience is not just about us on one hand you know, how we relate to it is how we could parlay it and relate it to another. And so I really view this this earth as a school, uh, not necessarily learning things that we don't know, but to apply that, you know, but to really learn, you know, through our different experiences so that we could relate to others here or, or over there. Um, you know, and lastly, I know we touched on, you know, the topic of suicide. And at this point, you know, from being in the mental health, you know, field, um, we know someone with an addiction. We usually know someone who unfortunately has had uh, ideations of suicide, has has, has attempted, and it's something that is becoming more um, of a household situation. And I think the significant thing is, is to understand uh, the degree of shame and judgment when it comes to suicide. You know, they have done research and studies that, you know, people who have you lost your loved ones to completion of suicide. The, the amount of support goes down significantly versus those that don't. And, you know, there's a degree of shame and just people not knowing what to do or whatever that is. And so I think it's important, you know, how we look at those who may have made the decision in a sense that we often talk about the last part of their life and their action and not the life that they lived. Or we talk about maybe them in judgment that they were suffering, but not seeing them as people who were incredibly strong dealing with all that they were dealing with each and every day and seeing that as the battle that they faced. And so as a mental health uh, therapist, I don't differentiate mental health from physical health. And I think we shouldn't either. 
you know, people say that person committed a suicide, but we won't say that person committed a heart attack or cancer. And so we criminalize mental health instead of learning how to have compassion, empathy, understanding, you know, to it. And I think that will go a long way. So those are a little bit of takeaways regarding grief, uh, but certainly Dr. Lenore, um, I'm sure you have a lot more to add and to continue to build off of, you know, that uh, perspective. Yeah, I'll just say a couple words and then we can even open it up. But I just want to say thank you for saying that. I know that we both know people who've who've died by suicide um, and being a widow by suicide and being, I mean, I was a widow at 36, a widow by suicide in the context of sexual abuse of a male. And all of a sudden I'm talking to dead people. Like, could there be anything more stigmatized? I don't really know. Maybe I just... And when all of that happened, there's immense, and I say this almost tongue in cheek, because I feel like maybe at a soul level, I'm like really taking one for the team, or I really signed up for my soul to experience it all. I don't know. But I guess if there's any just piece of advice that I could offer, it's our experiences are not who we are. And the sh if anyone, and I have seen it, I've seen it myself. I say, you know, my husband passed away and people kind of like back up, like, oh my gosh. And if I say it's by suicide, it's almost like especially in the beginning when I was new to this, there was like an underlying assumption of, well, what went wrong or what, why didn't you know, or how could you not see, especially being a social worker, how did you not know and being married and together for years? And I think the, I guess if there's a piece of advice to offer or just maybe an alleviation of the burden that we carry around that, it's that we did the best that we could in the moment, given the information that we had. And when I look back at Bruno's and my life, it was happy. We had an incredible marriage. We had an incredible partnership and he was my best friend. Looking back, I can count on one hand, less than one hand, how many times we fought in 13 years. Now vision is 2020 in hindsight. Now I see a couple that's together 13 years. It's fought three times. Well, maybe there's something underneath that. Yeah, we were both very peaceful to the point where we didn't want conflict. And maybe if we had been more conflict less conflict adverse, perhaps we would have talked about these things. Who knows? I don't know. But I think I don't, my perspective now is I don't, I don't look back at the past and wish that something was different. I never do. I can't because the present is what there is. And if I were to spend my life wishing that something were different, I just, I know that that's not possible, but I do know what's possible is going forward in a way of opening myself up to a different orientation. And so if there are some takeaways from Bruno's and my story. It's who cares what someone will think? I don't care if someone thinks that I'm nuts for being a medium. It is the realest thing to me now. And it has been my path forward in finding happiness and joy. And in many ways, joy that I've actually never even experienced, like an authenticity in my body that I've never felt before. And who cares if someone judges me for being a widow in my 30s by suicide? By me talking about it, maybe, maybe one other person won't experience what it's like to be a widow by suicide or to take your life or end your life. And so I just, I've, I've kind of gotten to a point where it's like anything that smells like drama, I just like, no, thank you, not for me. And I think part of that is really opening up to spirituality and, the, and a knowing that there's something bigger than this. And that I truly believe that everything that has happened in life thus far and everything that will happen is meaningful in some way. It's just a matter of moving into that meeting, meaning and letting it kind of unfold. And so I say very vocally, and I've talked to Bruno if this is okay, and I know he wants me to tell his story. I mean, within some parameters, there are some things that are sacred and are ours but I don't hide the fact and he doesn't hide the fact because he lived over 30 years in a body that hid what happened to him. He doesn't have to do that anymore. And he's believed and I tell him I believe him and he knows that we believe him. And I know that was part of why, why people who've gone through horrific things don't necessarily talk about it because they're afraid of not being believed or living in isolation. And I feel like the more that we're authentic to who we are and what our experiences are, the less we have to be isolated. So, I think I'll end with, with that of just kind of putting out this beautiful invitation for those of us who've gone through a traumatic loss and may feel 
their loved one, or actually even if you haven't gone through traumatic loss, but you feel something around you, be it a loved one on the other side, a curiosity, maybe you've had your own psychic experiences. I want to put it out there as these are meaningful and they're valid and they're real and no, you're not imagining it. No, you're not quote unquote crazy, which is what I would tell myself in my research. This is the kind of under number one underlying thing that we all ask is, is this something that we're making up? And the overwhelming evidence says, no, there are incredible uncanny similarities in our, in our experiences. And the more we lean into these intuitive and spiritual experiences, the more we move into a space where we feel good in our bodies, we live a life that's authentic, doors open up, opportunities happen. I mean, I live a life that is so much more peaceful in many ways. I'm so much more content. Things have happened that I never would have imagined. Like I live in Hawaii now and I know that Bruno led me here. I know that he's opened up things in my research and my career. And it's really by trusting both our relationship, the relationship with my other loved ones in spirit, and more than anything, the relationship with my own gut feeling and my own soul. And those relationships really deepen over time. They become more acute. We become more sensitive and more trusting of them the more that we practice and lean in. Yeah. Thank you. You know, um, they do a lot of studies of people who are about to cross over. And the number one regret that people have commonly is that they lived a life for someone else. Yeah. They lived a life for what someone else wanted them to be yeah. instead of living who they were intended to be, who they really are. And so many people live such small lives trying to satisfy everyone. We all have so many different people, so much input. And the important thing is to listen to that higher self, to listen to ourselves and especially when someone's grieving, you know, people ask me all the time, what should I do when someone's grieving? What I say, just be there, be present, listen, uh, but don't speak to them, you know, don't talk at them, you know, and just meet them where they're at and uh, being able to be present uh, and understanding, taking yourself out in the picture and entering their world. Yeah. And giving it the time too. I mean, all of this happened, it's been our experiences. I mean, as you said, it takes decades for some, for a child to integrate this. For me, it's been three and a half years and that feels like a blink. I mean, this, the integration of these, these perspectives, it's such an iterative, gentle process. We, we deserve to be gentle with ourselves in this iterative process. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Should we open it up for questions? Yeah, yeah. So we have, you know, I see some people, we here, if you have any questions, uh, um, like we said, it's not going to be evidential readings from my understanding, but more right. so um, specific to your path, to your grief, um, to making curiosity. sense of the curiosity, the afterlife, um, mental health. You know, we all are for any of your questions because we still um, have a lot more to share. And, <laughs> you know, you guys, I joke, I'm a guy, but um, I guess guys, we just have our blinders on. So when I have questions, they just open up my mind to their avenues and constantly looking at this through different uh, perspectives. So if anyone has any questions, by all means, please uh, feel free to share it in the chat box. Yeah, well, as it, yeah, that you just drop it in the chat just because we're recording. So instead of um, obligating anyone to go on camera, we'll just see them in the chat box and we'll address them. And you're welcome to also send them individually to either Jacob or I as well, if you prefer. Yeah, we don't bite. <laughs> Yeah. Not through a screen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're not, you haven't gotten that technology yet. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> if you have any questions or thoughts or reflections, uh, you know, feel free. I see some people typing them in, so give it a minute or two. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm used, I, I type a million miles an hour. So, <laughs> you know, everyone has their own. Um, so, Lenore, are you open to sharing any general trends that came up during your interviews with others? Is that? So I'm going to open up my chat box here okay. with with other folks who have had mediumship open up with losses. What would you say to that? Yes. Yeah. So I can um, speak to some of the general uh, findings. I'm working on my first or my findings report for the first round of interviews. So this is a study that I'm doing. I'm working on two different studies right now as a part of my private practice. And so this is just research I'm doing on the side that I know I've been called to do. Um, and this study that um, that our question asker is referring to 
is a study that I did an open-ended um, interview, a set of interviews of over 30 people now who have also had mediumistic openings when their loved one passed away. And so, so some of the general findings, the initial findings, it's interesting. So the people that I'm speaking with are, they're from different or at different stages in their development. So some people have just opened up to this and they haven't done formal readings, for example, for some, for others. Some are mediums who are in development and some are professional working mediums. Across the board, every single person in the experience went through kind of a similar trajectory. The first thing is this kind of overwhelming, sometimes it's chaos, but it's a state of overwhelm in terms of like our world has been turned upside down. And that's really related to, in some ways, it's contingent upon the trauma of the grief to what extent our human life is obliterated. Um, for example, whether or not the loss was expected, which even if there's anticipatory grief, it's still incredibly, and even my throat is getting blocked with that of how difficult it can be. If there's anticipatory grief, um, for example, or um, like if someone's loved one passed and um, it was a peaceful passing at old age, that would be a, perhaps, perhaps a different experience than losing um, a child, for example, perhaps. Again, that's a generalization. Regardless, there is a period of chaos in the beginning that relates to the loss, but it also relates the other side to this is suddenly being able to speak with the spirit world. And so we've all gone through this initial point of chaos. As that moves over time, and what really helps it move over time is both the function of time, two, a healing and surrendering to the grief experience, three, a healing and surrendering to perhaps an openness to this contact that's happening. We find a peace, and not to say that that chaos doesn't totally dissipate, it's still quite active for some time, these two experiences of both mediumship and grief are interacting, but we find a peace, and sometimes, like for me, it happened instantaneously, like I found a peace, but I was also in chaos, and this back and forth would happen for years, um, but there is a peace, and there's a knowing, and by peace, and P-E-A-C-E, -E, a peace, and a knowing that this is part of our way forward. As another piece to that, as P-I-E-C-E, -E, so as a piece <laughs> to the peace, yeah, right? Yeah of what helps the peace become an integrated part of our lives. It's finding community. It's finding community with other people who are going through this. It's a normalization of what's happening. It's a validation of what's happening. And it often then moves into a development of our, our, of our abilities. Now, whether or not that means that someone becomes a professional developing or a professional medium who gives readings, or maybe like for me, I gave readings for a couple of years then moved out of it because I knew that I was pulled to do, I do readings now with regard to um, the education that I do, around, so the programs that I run, and then also in my research. So if you've done a research interview with me, chances are it also turned into a reading just because our loved ones came through and it was a very different way of doing a reading. It's more a working meeting with our loved ones, really, as our loved ones come through in the interviews because they're very much a part of this. Um, but it doesn't necessarily matter what the objective is, and there really isn't a, a, an objective at the outset anyway of where mediumship is leading us to. It's more an unfolding, almost like a lotus flower, of letting that experience unfold. But we find that especially when there is that kind of critical juncture of moving from this is chaotic and terrifying and overwhelming and no one believes me, I don't believe myself, what is going on? There's this kind of juncture, again, it's nebulous and it's back and forth, but we do shift into a space that says, this is a part of me and it's, it brings me strength. It gives me hope. It's part of my identity. I move into, I'm moving into a place of living a life that feels right with my loved one working with me. And yes, I still miss them tremend tremendously. And yes, their physical body, I wish it was here. But I know that in some ways they're here. They're opening me up to this big world that may be on the other side that I never knew was, was there. And as I surrender to it, my life in this physical world is getting bigger and it feels more authentic. That's kind of the overarching, very preliminary analysis, and it gets much more minute as we go into the details, but I hope that answered your question of what are some of the general takeaways of that kind of general trend. There's so much value of the group connectivity, and yes. when you think of the afterlife, I think of oneness, and to me, you know, the opposite of that is feeling isolated, yeah. and when you're able to feel that cohesive support, it's a, it could be a lifting and you're able to see yourself 
uh, within another. But we have a lot of, um, I know Mary asks, lately I've been wondering about time on the other side. I have heard that time is not measured for us as humans. What do you believe a time on the other side? Uh, certainly from someone who's been there, I could say the other side is our essence, where we come from, where we're infinitely connected to. So we are timeless because we come from a place of timelessness and we have a one-way ticket back home where we're here temporarily, but that you know is, is a place of home. So there is certainly no time. It's timeless and it's eternal in its nature. Uh, yeah, so let's take turns uh, reading off some of these great questions. So Lenore, Dr. Lenore, what questions do you see? So I see, do, 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 sorry, I have a few direct ones. So let me just There's take a few. Um, okay, I'll read. I'm just going in chronological order of how we've received, but there are some that might be a direct message. So I'll read the, the next one, which is a DM. Um, so without, I, of course, we won't read the names for direct messages. Um, the question is, or the comment, I've had many experiences with my fiance post his death. How do I know if I have a quote unquote gift of mediumship or I'm just incredibly lucky? I've had a couple of dreams where some spirits come out have, I'm sorry, where some spirits have come through to give me a message, but only two experiences. How do I expand on that to get more? I'm not sure. Okay, beautiful. Such a good question. I love this question. And th first of all, it's very brave to write this and to articulate it. So thank you for writing it. And I can also guarantee that you are not the only person thinking this. And I can say from, from experience, I have thought this as well. So I spent the first eight, nine months of my experiences wondering if this would ever turn off? Actually, no, it was even after I started working as a medium. I would wonder, like, is this going to turn off like a light switch someday? Um, is it in the beginning, I thought, is it only Bruno that I speak with, even though, again, a couple spirits would come through? And really, it's this process of our human mind, our human brain trying to comprehend this incredible experience that's opening up to us. As soon as I started developing formally as a medium, my mediumship exploded. It just went just like... Poof. And it was, and that's another trend that's come out of this, the study that I referred to before. As soon as we begin developing, it's like the, the door is, it's like the sign on the door is flipped. All of a sudden we're open, open for business. And spirit is like, fresh meat, we're here. We want to work with you. And it's a really beautiful thing, but it can also be a bit overwhelming. Um, an interesting trend that came out of my research that I experienced Myself and at least two other people that participated in my study, we began having spirits come to us who had passed over in homicides. People we never knew, but they would give us information about their passing, and we were able to actually validate it. And one of the people who I know actually helped solve a case. And this is, it, it could be that this is opening up an ability that you have of like psychic detective work or working. I mean, there are mediums who work with the police. Or it could be just spirit is coming to you. I would get a lot of spirits who came to me that had gone through abuse as well. And so spirit comes to you knowing that you can understand some of their experience. But I said, this was way too early in my grief. And I just told, when I say spirit, I mean like the spirit world. I said, this is not, I, I asked one of my mentors, what do I do with this? And I said, I just put a parameter of I'm not in a place human wise to go there. And it that closed off. But it's this kind of opening and trial and error of where do we really thrive and where are our kind of, I don't know, where are our talents when we communicate with spirit? I would say if anyone has had this experience of spirits coming to you, whether in a dream or otherwise, you absolutely have this. And I'll even go further in th than that and say all of us have this capability. Every single human being, we've all had a gut feeling. We've all felt something when we walk into a room, whether we're comfortable or not. We've all met someone that kind of gave us the heebie-jeebies or we met someone that's like, oh my gosh, I really love their energy. It's a matter then of learning how to tune into what we're feeling intuitively in our bodies, in what we're getting, what we're seeing, knowing how we get what we get and then trusting it. And that just takes practice. Um, in terms of where to go and how then to develop. So a couple of things I do, I teach classes. So you're more than welcome to send me a message and I'm happy to send you any information. I have a program that's for, for beginning. Um, it's not even beginning mediums. It's anyone who's at a beginning point of diving into and exploring your intuitive abilities. Um, so my 2024 program starts in January. And then I lead a 
bi-weekly now it's every other week because I'm traveling a intuitive development meditation class which is just drop in and all of those are on my website and we'll drop these at the end and then I also have on my resource page lots of places to go to explore classes um, and I'll drop those all in and I'll send them in the email as well but there are so many credible incredible places to develop your skills um, it's just really a matter of kind of finding what works for you and a lot of trial and error and honoring the moments when we need to step back a little bit too. Yes, yes. Okay. So we have a lot of great questions here. Um, I can so would you like for me to, to read yeah. one or yeah? Yeah. Um, so someone asks for those who have crossed over by taking their lives, um, is it something that happened in a past life that was ever resolved? Mm -hmm. And for us survivors, I sometimes feel like it's a lesson I have to learn. Um, hmm. This is a personal issue uh, for myself as I, in my own past life, which has come through evidentially uh, in other readings and something that I saw within my NDE, I had a life that I remembered in my last lifetime in which I crossed over, you know, due to uh, suicide. And I think my NDE was very much related to that lifetime because you know, the feeling that I got in that last lifetime was that my back was against the wall. There was no hope and I didn't see anything possibly changing. And I made a decision and I obviously saw, you know, that there wasn't judgment or condemnation, nothing like that. Uh, but the NDE was similar. I was facing a similar situation, which I was suffocated. The life force was taken from me. There was no hope or anything. And then I made a decision to let go of that suffering and to surrender to something greater than my own pain and to work through it. And I think when people are going through whatever that is, whether it be physical, mental health, trap, whatever that is, the significance of allowing yourself to ask for help, you know, to receive support to know that you're not alone and to find ways to process, you know, what is. And so um, at times, you know, people could come back when that was their decision, not always, uh, but they do continue to work through, you know, that situation. Um, and people on the other side oftentimes continue their work um, who have made that decision to help us over there, over here so that others could, you know, maybe when they're stuck, could get unstuck. Um, I know, for instance, I had a my, my own best friend, you know, completed suicide. And the minute after he did it, I received a text message uh, from a radio show to have me on their program. And it was just a reminder that you just have to chop wood and you carry water. We still have to do the work here. We have to do it uh, for them too. And we have to live a life for them. I think that's important is, uh, yes, we have to go through the grief process, but to live for them. Um, I had a grandfather that never believed in the afterlife, but he would always say to me, I live through you because a part of me is in you. And so I think our lives should be an undeniable proof of the loved ones that have come and gone before us and the good that they brought to us and continuing on their legacy and doing all the things that maybe they wish they, they could do here. Uh, and so it's not so much about death, but it's about life. And when you're seeing death to really remember the eternal life, and that is uh, thrown your way. Um, I don't know if you had anything to add to that, uh, you know, question. It's a very deep question. It's hard to get into for, for time's sake, but I don't know for from your end, from both sides of it, do you have any other additional perspectives to it? I think that was a beautiful way that you described it. I think, uh, and I'll keep this succinct, suicide is so complex. And what leads to suicide, I mean, there are myriad routes to why suicide suicidality happens um and i i i believe that i don't believe that it was bruno's quote unquote destiny to take his life i've had mediums tell me that and i just don't agree i do believe that part of his soul work in this life was to address the karma around his abuse and perhaps that carried over from another life i don't know um i'm also very careful talking about past lives because i at being a medium, some has some information has come into me about people's past lives, but that's not my area of expertise by any means. And personally, I haven't had a lot of experience with my own. Um, in my meditations, it tends to be very much in this physical life. Um, and even in 
future lives, which I was like, oh, wow, that's going to be wild. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm careful not to make generalizations based on other research or other people's findings. But I will say, I do believe, actually, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that regardless of some, how someone passes over, there's immense healing work for ourselves individually and for the collective that we can do with them. And the more that we kind of address in authentic, in authentic ways that, again, if it feels right in my body, then I know it's authentic. Addressing that karma, which to me is just like the energy around the passing, the negativity, how we feel, how I carry the pain in my body. The more that I address that in myself, I know the ripple effects in me and around me shift. And I feel like that's part of the work that we do when our loved ones cross over by taking their lives, by ending their lives, by dying by suicide. Um, I don't believe, and I'll say this at the outset, I know that this is not the case because I just, I know this from what Bruno has shown me. Again, this is before I knew anything about this mediumship stuff and business. And I've worked with many people who's, whose loved ones have taken their, have, have ended their lives, excuse me. Um, they don't go into, they don't go to hell. Hell doesn't even exist. If there's something like that, it's akin to the things that we have to live in the pain here. There's no like purgatory. It's not like, there's no extra suffering on the other side. There's just, I have not seen any, any evidence of that. And so to me, that's just, is not the case. But again, we still do address our pain on the other side. And part of helping our loved ones address their pain is by addressing our pain around their passing. I think there's a lot of um, maybe projection of, you know, authority figures onto God and some of those authority figures, whether that be, you know, policeman, teacher, principal, uh, parent, whatever that is, and how they relate to pain. But I always say, what kind of God will kick you when you're down? And aren't we all a part of God's creations? Yeah. And so it makes no sense why that is there, that there's judgment you know, that's the least, that's the last thing that you need from a God with unconditional love. Um, and that's a God that I want no part of if, if uh, that is the case. <laughs> and, and that is, that is not the case. It's never been proven. It's never been come out through evidential readings. You know, the ultimate source of God is eternal, unconditional love. Mm -hmm. So we have some other great questions here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you, your turn. All right. I'll take the next one. And yeah. the it's, Thank you for asking this. And I don't really talk, the one that I'm reading now, just going chronologically, and it's, Dr. Lenore, are you open to finding new love at some point? How do you move on in the our world now after your loss? And I say thank you for asking this because being a widow, and especially a widow at this age, it's so stigmatized and everybody has an opinion. Everybody has, everybody has an opinion on what you should do, what you shouldn't do. Um, usually they're unsolicited opinions, so I did not ask for them, but there's all kinds of advice. And it's also, Bruno and I never had children and I wanted to have a family with him and that did not happen. And so there's also a whole other animal that has opened up with what I should or should not do about pregnancy and family planning. And again, this is, I think a lot of widows experience this. Um, so I want to address this question with an open heart. And I don't talk about this very much because it's one of the most sensitive parts of my experience. Um, but am I open to finding new love? Like, absolutely. It will never be Bruno and I. Bruno is my soulmate for this life. And maybe there's other soulmates. I'm not opposed to that understanding. I don't know. But the reason I say absolutely is, and it has nothing to do with what he wants for me. This is what my heart feels. I believe that, I mean, I have so much love to give and that's in terms of with family, friends, partners, animals, everyone. And while Bruno and I will always be Bruno and I, and I love him tremendously and I will always love him. And I, I mean, I wear our rings around my neck. I have his ashes next to me. It's like, he's, he is me and I am, I am him. That doesn't mean that, and it doesn't mean that the hole in my heart will not be there but it's almost like the whole will be there and then other experiences are just kind of with that, right? I know that shall there be love in the future in terms of partnership, I'm not in a relationship now, it will be someone who I know he will put on my path and I know someone who will understand my experience. And I also know it will be a point when my, my soul is at a point where that's okay. I haven't talked much about in my own um, 
platforms about things like dating and all of these things, which, you know, maybe I'll get to a point. I'm on a couple of podcasts coming up with other young widows, and I'm sure we'll go there. So do stay tuned. But again, I think the reason why it's so sensitive, it's because it is not only is it so stigmatized, but it's also there is no rule book out there. Like, is there a rule book or a guidebook for grief at all? No. Is there for if you've lost your husband at 36 by taking his life and now you've talked to spirits on the other side? Like, did not find a guidebook. If you have one, please send it my way. I would love to see the roadmap. But it's really we find our own way forward. But in terms of um, people have asked me, do you think that Bruno would be angry or jealous? No, I actually feel him working with me all the time. And I feel like some of the experiences that I've had already, he's helped me find them. Um, and I also feel like on the other love, on the other side, there's just immense love in so many ways. And so people who've remarried, I know from bringing in their loved ones through mediumship readings, both partners or three or four partners are on the other side. And it's just a different way of looking at love. So, so thank you for asking that. Okay. Um, is there any other questions that you see here? I'm trying to find others. Um, I have questions. some direct ones here. Um, and I want to make sure that we do get to all of them. Yes. Um, sorry, that one we already entered to do. Okay, I'll ask this. And Jake, you might also be able to speak to this um, from your experience. The question is, I'm curious, or if you even know, if the quote unquote work Bruno is having to do on the other side to address his pain takes away from the love, light, and peace he receives on the other side. So it's, I, as I understand that, like, is the work that he's doing on the other side sort of stigmatized, or does it take away from, from you know, being in this beautiful light space? Um, no, I don't think so. I, from what I understand, no. I mean, yes, he's doing the work. He has different experiences there, different resources, different orientations. Um, I have felt from him remorse, and that's something that he's working through, and I feel like he has worked through it. Now when he comes forth mediumistically, both to me and to other mediums, he is big, and I know he's good, but it's now years and years and years of very hard work through me and with me, and I also know that there are you know, scars in, in our relationship that we will deal with when I get to the other side, regardless of if I remarry or whatever that may be. Um, I feel... When he would come to me in the very early months, like the first year until I found out all the pieces that really helped me understand what happened to him. And again, I'll never have the full story, only he does. And even there, he may not remember it all. Maybe on the other side, he does. But I would feel him sometimes come to me like a baby. And sometimes I feel he would come to me at the ages where he would have endured the most acute abuse. And I feel like that was at the points where he was really addressing that pain on the other side. Now, when he comes to me, he just, his body, he comes to me very physically. His body is healthy. He's big. He's strong. He's, he's, he's good now, but again, that's immense work. And it will always be within a context of, I do feel that he wishes that he had done things differently. However, again, there's no regret. It's like, we can't live in regret because that will just eat us alive regardless of what side we're on. So it's like, okay, this is what we, this is where we are, are at right now. How are we moving forward with this? How are we existing right now with this? Um, and it's by sending love, by talking about him, by working with him, that that augments both of our vibration and it helps us to move forward in that. Wow. <laughs> well. You know, I, I, I think for this in our society, we're often thinking like places like Disney World is the other side, or the Wizard of Oz is the other side, and that is a part of it—the, the bliss, the, you know, incredible views. It's kind of like this buffet, whatever um, high point of reality we want, we could, we could have. Uh, but there's a lot of people that try to find God. And then there's those who embody God. And to me, the embodiment of God is better than finding it because it's knowing it and living it. And to me, God is about service. It's about giving over. It's about support. And the times we don't certainly feel that way when these circumstances happen. Uh, but when I, to me, when I think of God, I think of, you know, giving life back. And, you know, certainly I'm here because of that in many ways, and we all are. And so I think those on the other side continue to embody God through service. 
Um, sure, there's recharge and you know going to sure beautiful places and you know experiencing euphoria. But the greatest um, sensation that one could have is by giving we receive in a way, and we're making this world a better place over here. And we could also do it over there too. We continue to give life itself to others, and that is the God realization you know, that people experience over here and over there. I'll say as well, from a mediumship perspective, it's so interesting. And I was shocked the first reading that I had, again, this is opening up to me as a medium, but the first time I had a reading, I was shocked at how Bruno, Bruno was Bruno. Like he was so still Bruno. Right. He wasn't, you know, this like sage on a stage and a robe with, like, you know, a staff. He was still right. Bruno showing up in a soccer jersey. Right, right. Uh, like when my grandmother comes to me, she's and she passed over 20 years ago. And I have this beautiful relationship with her now in spirit. Now that I know how to tap in, we weren't particularly close when she was here. And she's still my feisty grandma. She yeah. is different in that she can open up in ways because we grow and we continue to evolve on the other side. And again, Bruno coming happy and big in these different ways. Yes, we shift and evolve, but we're still ourselves. We're still our essence of our one drop that we are in this beautiful ocean. Yeah. And vanity doesn't stop on the other side. I think I find that people oftentimes I find will want to look like in their prime to us and they want to will look like how they want to be remembered, you know, in their prime and their um, pinnacles of their lives too. not, you know, remembered by the end or the struggle. You know, they really want to be remembered in their physical, emotional primes too. And that's you know, the part that they want us to remember us them them by. That's the real self that they've, you know, hold on to. Yes, I agree. We have two more questions that I'm seeing. One is a DM and one is a general. Yeah. So I'll start with the general. This is such a good question. And this I can speak to from the research. So Dr. Lenore, you and Bruno had a very close and loving relationship. Do you have any comments about those who've passed with whom we had difficult or unresolved relationships? So I'll draw on a case uh, from the research that I referred to before of people who've had mediumistic openings after a loved one crossed. So one of my study participants, and I can say this as it was in the context of the interview, so consent was given to share this, of course, with anonymity. And she had a very, very, very difficult relationship with her dad. Um, and he passed when she was an adult. He passed a few years ago. Her mediumship had opened up um, it, I believe it opened up, if I remember correctly, within the context of someone else's passing, but through that mediumship experience and through her trust in speaking with spirit, she began to get to know her dad on the other side. And very similarly to what happened with Bruno and I, we began to uncover really the depths of the relationship and the scars and the pain and the trauma and what caused the relationship to be how it was in the physical world that we can't necessarily either pinpoint as physical humans, because either our brains or our trauma or our bodies will let us go there. We don't, that's not available, or it's the fear of going there, right? It's such a process. That's why we go to therapy to try to figure out what's in our deep psyche. Uh, but when we work with our loved ones on sp in spirit, it's almost like it's so transparent and all of the biases and really all I see the BS is just gone. Like it, Bruno and I have an even closer relationship now because there's no more, there are no more facades. Now we actually do have arguments and we do let it out. Whereas before it would have been, and it's funny, I've actually been walking down the street arguing with him, with, arguing with him and people look at me like, is she okay? I'm like, don't worry, don't worry about me. Just having a, an argument with my husband on the other side. We're just working through it. And I actually have explained that. Anyway, that's that's like an entire book in its own realm, right? But, but when there are difficult relationships, if and when, or when and if our human is open to going there to that relationship. That loved one on the other side will want to work with you and uncover and open up and move through. And oftentimes they're opening up and understanding that pain or the trauma or the difficulty of the relationship. And this was with my interviewee, for example, her dad was opening up and starting to really take ownership of his actions and his behaviors and where he was on the other side, thanks to life review, thanks to being able to live life through her eyes at some points, through his ability to see the way and things in his own childhood, things that he, a perspective he had over there that he did not have access to over here. He was able to work with her and they're really digging into healing immense trauma in their relationship. And this is something, I mean, we'll 
hopefully get there in this lifetime in the in our field in mental health work and clinical work I mean there is a spiritual counseling that happens when we work with our loved ones on the other side and this is what I say about working with grief informed and trauma informed mediums this is like a process over time it's not like one reading will solve everything and for some people one reading is sufficient and that's great um, but for me, I mean, I was with working through this with Bruno and I for years, both myself and working with mediums and other healers. And I think if we have a relationship that really is asking us to explore and dig into the healing, it's there if we want to. And so we can really move into a place where we come into beautiful resolution with our loved ones on the other side, because they aren't just memories, they're not just imprints, they're actively working with us. And if we open to working through difficulties, difficulties in a relationship, they are absolutely open to it. So through our own meditations, through journaling, through prayer, if you pray, through working with mediums, if you believe in working with mediums, these are all ways that we can work through this relationship in a sort of, again, like spiritual counseling with our loved ones on the other side. Oh, I think you're muted, Jake. <laughs> Unmuted. So it's <laughs> possible to have continual dialogue over here and over there and yeah. similar dynamics, just more access. And, yeah. you know, there's no excuse of work or a job or taking out the trash. You know, we're all, you know, the communication lines are, are open. The phone plans aren't needed. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, have I have some one. one or two other good questions. Uh, okay. Cindy says, Cindy, says, how do you how do you think of the feeling of oneness versus individual souls? How can these two be compatible with each other? Um, what I would say is oneness does not mean sameness. You know, oneness, part of oneness is we're all different octaves on this, you know, symphony that we're a part of, and each person has a different divine spark within them, a different light within them, but it's all from the same source. So it's just a different expression. And so, yes, we have individual, but we're also, you know, collective. So the me is with the we. And so um, the individual improves when it remembers its source and the source remembers of it all when, re when it remembers the individual part. So I think it starts with us and our connectivity and that will help itself to how we relate to others. It's not seeing someone outside of us separate. And hopefully the last couple of years have taught us that, you know, someone else on the other side of the world isn't on the other side of the world, but it is a part of the human body and connected to us too. And we're all a part of this, what Carl Jung would speak about this, you know, uh, the uh, this collective consciousness, you know, we're all, you know, a part of this uh, phyla. Um, but I think what's important is to recognize that, yes, you could be an individual, but you could also be a part of that collective, that two things could be true at the same time as we are multidimensional. So it doesn't have to always be unidimensional in how we see or view ourselves. Beautiful. Um, I have a direct message here that I'll speak to. How do you know that the spirit, oh, this is a very good question. They're all beautiful questions, but this is a really important one. How do you know that the spirits you're connecting to are not going to harm you? I've had a few experiences with spirits since my partner passed, but I'm a bit scared of strengthening this connection because I'm unsure of what I may be opening myself up to. Thank you for asking this. This is absolutely a question that I had. I leaned on, I still lean on Bruno all the time and just say like, you are my, and he is, he's very much my kind of, he's the gatekeeper for me. And I've had experiences, I've had experiences where I was so bombarded by spirits trying to come through. It was one particular, I was at, I was at a yoga retreat. It was about a year ago and I went for myself and I was just going to, you know, just be one with my body. And I got there without knowing every single person at this retreat had lost someone traumatically. Everyone was working through grief. This was not a grief retreat. I called my mentor halfway through. I was like, I just came to do some downward dog and all the spirits are coming to me. And he was like, well, spirit really sent you on this retreat for other work. And I was like, oh man, like, okay, I'm here for it. So one, if you have a loved one in spirit, who's kind of your door opener, which my first mediumship teacher told me, she's like, if when you've lost a loved one on the other side and you have your awakening, you are on the fast track, which I very much felt that was the case. So I say, lean on your loved one, lean on your guides, lean on who you know, and ask them to be kind of a protector, a partner. 
I have, I have very strict boundaries with spirit. This is kind of the second thing I would recommend. I tell spirit, like, when I'm not working, I'm not working. Usually that works, but uh, not all the time. So I have people come to me on the other side that are really desperate to get a message through to their loved one. And I've made up a rule with spirit by now for ethical reasons. I, I, there's so much to say about the ethics of mediumship, but I tell the person in spirit, if your loved one is supposed to hear this message, you need to bring them to me in a formal channel or in some way that is unmistakable, unequivocal, that they are ready to hear this message, that they want to hear this message. And incredible things happen so that that happens every time. Um, but there are some times that spirit comes to me where I those boundaries just, they kind of like bulldoze through them. So for example, in dreams, I don't dream a lot, but recently the last few months I've been getting wild spirit visitations from dreams. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know this at the time, but there was, I've also started seeing apparitions lately, which isn't, wasn't my norm before, but there was a man in my room a few weeks ago. I woke up in the middle of the night and I could feel from his energy. It wasn't either Bruno or my grandfather. And those are the two men that typically come to me. So I could feel it was a man. I just, I didn't know his energy. And so I told Bruno, come close. I feel Bruno, Bruno to me. And he's so a part of me that I can't always tell when he's here and he's not. So I just accept that we're always a part of each other. We just are. But I felt Bruno unmistakably come close. And I said, okay, like I'm ready to go back to sleep. It's four in the morning. Come on, like, let me sleep. And I fell asleep and had this visceral dream. I mean, just incredibly visceral. It was so real. I could like take it apart like a puzzle. It was so tangible that I could feel it. And I woke up and in the dream, a friend of Bruno's and my, who's still in the physical world, she was in that dream. And I voice noted her immediately after and told her about this experience and I, about the man in my room and he was in the dream and what happened, what he looked like and what we were working through in the dream. And she wrote me or she voice noted me back instantly. And she said, Len, that's my dad. And he passed away last night. And so we moved into a reading informally. Again, she's a very good friend of mine. So that was a boundary I was okay with. Again, I get to set the terms on how I work. Everyone, including the person who asked this question, you get to know your boundaries and your parameters more and more as you develop, as you practice. But we did an, an impromptu reading, this friend and I inviting her dad close in Bruno. And this is one of those experiences with a lot of healing and spirit counseling that's going to be happening with that relationship over time. But I know that Bruno came close to help that that the, the, our friend's dad transition to the other side and open up now this beautiful way of mending a relationship that really does need mending and that she would be the first to say that. And she's like, this opened up something that was never available to us in the physical world. Hmm. So going back to the question, sorry, I moved away from this, but how do you know that they're not going to harm you? If I ever get scared, and in the beginning I was, is it's like this, it's more because this world is opening up and all of a sudden people are around me and I can feel them and see them. And sometimes I take on their emotions and I can't tell what's mine or theirs. I know, and I set the, this intention. I mean, we did it, Jake and I, before we even came on this call. Every time I work with spirit, I set an intention where I call in my soul, I call in my guides, I call in the light everything and the intention I always said is everything that I'm doing with spirit is only in love and light. I don't believe in dark energies. I do believe that humans can have that, but I've never met in a reading. I've never met a spirit person that was like bad or evil or malicious. I've met some spirits that weren't my favorite and I'm sure I was not their favorite. And that happens in human life too. You know, we can't be everybody's cup of tea and that's fine. But bringing close and just constantly feeding into when you work with spirit, this is in love and light, it really does shift a vibration and it sets an intention and an expectation that that is how you work and how you receive energy. So that's first. Second, calling in your loved one to work with you as a partner. Third, it slipped my mind. Boundaries. <laughs> that was it. The most important one. It didn't slip my mind. The third one, boundaries. And just telling spirit, like when you're closed, you're closed. And yes, they might bulldoze sometimes, or yes, there might be an exception, like a very good friend. And we work with spirit and yes, they might be malleable at some point, but we really do get to say, this is how I work and how I don't. I would go absolutely ballistic if I lived my life constantly having a spirit person with me. I mean, that's just, I live a very human life. Like I, I like my human life and I've got to live my human life, even the parts that I don't like. Um, 
And I think spirit knows that as well, but it's really having boundaries. And then finally, when you do develop, and again, you can find this on my website, what website, excuse me, going to places to develop that are reputable, that have a reputation that is positive and light. So for example, Arthur Finley College in the UK has incredible training. I did a lot of my training there. The Journey Within, which is in New Jersey, it was run by the late Reverend Janet Nohavik. Um, extremely ethical. And that's where I really kind of honed in on my ethics. Um, Tony Stockwell is one of my main mentors, extremely kind, loving, ethical person. Um, and so really going to places, Circles of Wisdom as well, which is in the Boston area, incredibly beautiful space. So going places that have good reputations um, and just trying them out and trusting your gut. If you feel like you're in a development circle, for example, where it just doesn't feel like it's jiving or it's not your style, then trust that and that's okay. It's a lot of kind of trial and error. Just scanning here, if there are any other. A lot of positive comments, you know, a lot of gratitude and we send that back to you all. You know, we are grateful for all of your time and your presence here. Um, you no, know, thank you obviously for joining us. I'm wondering if there's any last question or any last thought that you may have to to share. Um, there, I, uh, I don't have any last questions, but if there's anyone here in the comment box, if there are any last questions, we're happy to take one more. I know we're at the two hours, so thank you for hanging in. Yeah. I'll say a comment if that's all right to everyone here. Thank you for your openness and your curiosity. And especially if, especially, excuse me, if you're coming forth after loss, after trauma, after grief, through, not even after, in, right? There is no after, it's like it shifts, it moves, it, it, it transmutes in some ways, but it's a part of us. So if you're here, especially in, in, with an NDE as well, I mean, an NDE is going to be a part of you forever. The loss of Bruno is going to be a part of me forever. And so we all have stories, we all have, we all have a reason that brought us here. And so thank you for honoring your reason and for being open to perspectives and evidence and also maybe some subjective information as well that might help us perhaps understand those experiences in a different way. And the energy here, I mean, this is because we're all here. It wouldn't be any of us. I mean, Jake and I could talk to each other for hours, but it's a lot more fun with everyone here. Oh. Well, you know, thank you, Dr. Lenore, for organizing this. And thank you all for coming. I think for... For you all in front of us, you give us, you keep us going. You know, without people who participate, you would very much make our life a lot more bleak. <laughs> you know, so you add a lot of light to our life, and you're the angels in our life for sure. And so, let's continue to stay in touch. You know, Dr. Lenore, for those who aren't sure how to find you, that you have a website and stuff. It's and drop so it here. Um, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, I'll drop nope. it in the chat box. There we go. Sorry, there it is. Um, so it's drlenormatthew.com, D-R-L-E-N-O-R-E-M-A-T-T-H-W.com. So I have weekly classes, bi-weekly now meditation um, classes, meetups for mediums who are practicing and developing. We just get together and practice and network and have fun. I have a, I teach an ongoing um, program once a year. It's a 10-week course of in, develop your and discover your intuitive abilities. So you're welcome to join there, it's for beginners. And I also have an online self-paced course that is coming out very soon called Continued Connection, which is something that Bruno and I developed and it's 15 practices to connect to your loved one on the other side. So, and also tons of research, tons of resources on my website, classes, resources for widow suicide loss, trauma, grief, mental health. Um, and those are all free resources that I list on my website. So that is there. And of course, um, Instagram and Facebook and now threads as well. At <sighs> Dr. Lenore Matthew. Yeah. yeah. And Jake, where can we find you? Yep. So um, you could find me at jacobelcooper.com. And I will be at Lilydale August 8th. You know, Lilydale is right outside of Buffalo. And I'll be presenting there if you're around the Lilydale area. I'm also going to be at the Angel Cooperative um, I believe it's July 23rd. It's a Sunday. That's in Richfield, Connecticut, giving a past life regression. Uh, at the same time, we're actually, my father grew up, you know, many decades ago. Um, so I have, you know, a lot of cool stuff. And you could find both of my books, you know, Life After Breath, The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, as well as, you know, individualized services, you know, through my website, jacobelcooper.com. And, 
You know, I also have a brand new podcast called The Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, you know, available on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes. And I know Dr. Lenore is going to be my guest, you know, in a bit. So please subscribe, stay tuned. And uh, we thank you all for being here. Um, so an honor to be present with you sharing, you know, words of insight and bring the hereafter into the here now in two different evidential angles uh, that we continue, we go on and we are so much more than how we see ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for being here. Yes, as someone just wrote, subscribe to Jacob's YouTube channel. It's wonderful. It is underscore to that. Absolutely. And we will be in touch and send this recording out as well. And we will post it on YouTube too. So please do be in touch. If it calls you, thank you for being here. And thank you for honoring your experiences as well. We so appreciated this. Thank you. And thank you, Jacob, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Good night, everyone.